Uh, so welcome. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jacob Lebez. I'm the new director of the Center for Judaic and Holocaust Studies at YSU. Uh, very glad to be here. This is the first major event that I've organized. I'm glad to see so many people, so many colleagues and friends from the community. Uh, tonight's talk is also important to me, or fun for me, for a number of reasons. Uh, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Shoal Kellner, who's an associate professor of sociology and Jewish studies at, uh, excuse me, at Vanderbilt University. And he'll be talking about the forgotten lessons of Jewish activism, how American Jews mobilized to fight for human rights in the USSR, and saved American Jewry in the process. Joel Kellner's research focuses on contemporary American Jews at the intersections of culture, politics, and religion in Jewish life. His first book, The Tours That Bind, Diaspora, Pilgrimage, and Israeli Birthright, published in 2010 with the NYU Press, won awards from the Association of Jewish Studies and the American Sociological Association. It is a book that I found extremely helpful for myself for thinking through major debates, not only about the birthright program in the United States, but about Jewish identity more broadly. Joel Kellner has a particularly strong and interesting talent for taking what are, at times, even acrimonious debates and breaking them down into bits that are not only digestible, but transforming it into a useful discussion. And I know that he'll continue with this tonight. I'm particularly interested in this topic because, as Andy Lipkin was mentioning earlier, this is a history that we, many of us, remember. I was 11 or so, 10, in 1987 when American Jewry marched on Washington, D.C. to free, we said, Soviet Jewry. My mother took a lead role in, in organizing the delegation from New Jersey, from our part of New Jersey, and she used to give speeches of the type that Shul may discuss in his talk tonight. And so this is personal for me. It's personal for me as well because for many years Shaul has been a friend and a mentor. I met him through the Wexner Graduate Fellowship which trains uh, future Jewish leaders entering different sorts of for different sorts of advanced degrees for the rabbinate, for cantorial school, for Jewish social work, and also for academia. And it's one of the few places where Jewish academics at a very early stage are trained to be part of a Jewish community. And that's one of the things that attracted me to the position here at YSU. Um, but you didn't come to hear me speak. Uh, and I've hopefully excited you enough uh, to be ready for Dr. Kellner. Give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you very much. Really, it's, it's, a, it's an honor to be here, to be the, fir the first event for, uh, for in, in, your, in your tenure here. Um, and it's a pleasure to be back in Youngstown. I was here for, uh, for Myra and Bill Benedict's daughter's wedding years ago. Um, we're going to see them actually in Tulane this summer, uh, this, uh, this winter. Um, Jacob's work on Czech Jewry has actually helped inform my own thinking about the American movement for Soviet Jews, and I've been doing some research on what actually happened in this movement in 1968. And if you know uh, anything about uh, uh, Czechoslovakia in, in 1968, there were, there were uh, events there as well. And he's published on the topic in ways that actually ties into some of the stuff that we're going to be looking at here. So I want to thank him as well for helping me make those connections. Um, so already the, the Oh, so I, I'm pressing my computer button to try to change this on the screen. I have to, all right, change the screen. The 1987, December 6, 1987, March on Washington, the rally to free Soviet Jewry has already been mentioned. We're going to start at the end. There was a mass exodus of Jews from the Soviet Union from the early 1970s through the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War. It happened in two waves, 1970, 71, through about 1979, and then again from 87 
on to the years after the fall of communism. And about a million and a half Jews fled the country. And when communism collapsed, it wasn't guaranteed that Jews would be leaving. And when you, and most of the people who were living in the Soviet Union did not leave when the country collapsed. There was a movement that was active all around the world, including in the United States, especially in the, in the United States, to gain immigration rights for Soviet Jews who were trapped in the Soviet Union, who were being persecuted as Jews, but were not allowed to leave if they wanted to. And there was pressure that was put on the Kremlin. And believe it or not, the Kremlin actually bent to pressure even in the 1970s. But this was a movement that was active. It laid the groundwork for a mass immigration. And the rally on Washington, the rally on the mall in Washington that happened in December 87, 30 years ago, was in some ways the culmination of the movement. It wasn't one of those rallies that starts a movement. It was one that you're seeing here. These people in, in, who are on, on the mall, there are a whole network of organizations behind them, of activists throughout the country that did the groundwork to turn these people out. And that does not just happen in an instant. That is something that's built. There were about 250,000 people who had gathered, and it was the largest gathering of American Jews in history, and remains so to this day. The dignitaries who spoke to this crowd crossed the aisle politically. You had um, civil rights icon, Congressman John Lewis, and speaking after him, you had Vice President George H.W. Bush. This was a cause that the Reagan administration embraced. And this was not a protest to force Reagan to take up the issue. Reagan had already been taking up the issue. This was a demonstration to Gorbachev, who was meeting with Reagan in Washington at this moment that American, American citizens, American Jews, felt that the issue of freedom for Soviet Jewry was an important issue, and that when the president was going to be raising this with Gorbachev, that Gorbachev would know that the president was not speaking only for himself, but he was speaking for all the people who were gathered in the mall, uh, on, on the mall as well. Oh, pressing the button. Click the Thank you. So, What were they fighting for? And very briefly, for those who are not familiar with the movement, we can let some of the movement's slogans tell the story. This is a social movement that begins in the States in the early 1960s. The first movement organization is founded in Cleveland, Ohio in 1963. The next two movement organizations are created in New York City a year, uh, about six months later in early 64. Um, and from the 60s through the end of the Cold War, they were mobilizing around slogans such as, well, this was the classic, let my people go. It was a call for free immigration. But there was also persecution of Jews in the Soviet Union, a denial of religious rights, a denial of cultural rights, in ways that other groups, everyone in the Soviet Union suffered, and everyone suffered in their own particular way. And for Jews, even though the Soviet Constitution guaranteed them the right to have schools in their national language, which in the Soviet Union was Yiddish, uh, and newspapers and theaters, the, so the, the Kremlin systematically closed down Jewish cultural institutions. They closed down synagogues. Here you're seeing report from Russia, 1956, 400 synagogues, 1964, 80 synagogues, All right. 1970, who knows? So there was concern about the closure of Jewish institutions. Jews who actually raised their voice to protest were persecuted for raising their voice to protest. Some were put on trial, imprisoned, and as those names became known in the West, Americans rallied behind them. And here you see, let my people go with, with prisoners who were essentially thrown in, in, into the gulag, into the gulag um, for demanding the right to either live as Jews in Russia or demanding the right to emigrate. 
And if you see over on the far, in the far corner, I am my brother's keeper. This was a key part of the, of the movement's activism. It was not just about doing something for American Jews. It was American Jews standing up and saying that they were going to take responsibility for their brothers and sisters who were, um, who were overseas. And behind, you'll see, let them live as Jews or let them leave. And that basically sums up what the movement was trying to accomplish. We'll go to the next slide. To give you a sense of the scope of the movement, this is, it was, at the time, it was huge. It was ubiquitous. Most American Jews were alive then, remember this movement, and the majority of them were touched by it personally in some way. This was a movement that brought Jews out into the streets. It was a movement that made the cover of Time Magazine, and it makes the cover of Time Magazine because it was shaking the foundations of Big Talk, so it was a movement that was implicated in Cold War politics. It was a movement that made it into the White House. Um, Avital Sharansky and, oh, I can't, I'm forgetting the name, and it's blocked on there, so I can't see who that is. Um, Soviet Jews who emigrated, meeting with the president, with the vice president. It was a movement that, like any good movement, created its protest music, and it even had a song by Peter, Paul, and Mary. Um, Elie Wiesel writes the what the feminine mystique was for feminism, what Silent Spring was for environmentalism, the Jews of Silence was for the Soviet Jewry movement, and it was written by Elie Wiesel. He's halfway between liberation from Auschwitz and winning the Nobel Peace Prize when he writes this book. And most importantly, it made it even to Saturday Night Live with Emily Latella, Bill Radner, asking, what's all this I hear about saving Soviet jewelry? Why do we need to save Soviet jewelry? <laughs> to which Chevy Chase says, Emily, it's jewelry. It is jewelry. Oh, well, that's very important. Never mind. <laughs> and you can, you can Google it, and I think you'll actually be able to find it. I teach about this movement now to students who were born after the, after the, the collapse of communism and after this movement ended. And this is all news to them, and they've never heard of it. They didn't know that this thing existed. Um, this is a movement that, for all of its influence at the time, that it made it into the White House, and it was part of a national political conversation, and it was in every type of Jewish institution, from the synagogues, to the schools, to the, to the summer camps. Um, to the JCCs and the federations, and you name it. Once it ended and the mobilization stopped, all the things that people did to be active and to create the Jewish culture that the movement helped to create disappeared, and it left a void. And it left a void such that people who remember the movement and are looking back will often say, when, they're, when someone reminds them of this, that there was such a movement. Where's the next Soviet Jewry movement for American Jews? Where's that next galvanizing cause? Where's that next, that next cause that will unify and, and bring Jews out into the streets in, in, in assertions of Jewish pride? There's a huge nostalgia for the movement. Um, but the movement did not just appear. And the idea that where's the next Soviet Jewry movement it will drop from the clouds, the movement was the result of the work of the activists who succeeded in creating a mass movement. And the activists who built the movement learned a lot. They learned a lot about activism, and much of what they learned has been forgotten. And what I want to do this, this, this afternoon, this evening, is to try to recover some of that lost knowledge. And I'll give you a bit of background as to, as to how I came to this. So this, what, I'm, what I'll be speaking about is part of a book project that is looking at the American movement for Soviet Jews. And even though this is about the Soviet Jewry movement, I'm not actually talking about Soviet Jews. I'm looking at what this movement did for the Americans, um, the American Jews who were mobilizing and how this movement shaped American uh, Jewish life. So there has been research that's been done on the movement. There's a phenomenal history of the movement 
written by Gal Beckerman, who used to be a journalist with Ford. The book is called When They Come For Us, We'll Be Gone. And if you're interested in this movement, this is it's the best book that's out there, and I highly, highly recommend it. Um, a lot of the work that has been done on the movement has looked at the politics of this. And how did American Jews get the US government to pressure the Soviets and to condition uh, most favored nation trade status for the Soviet Union on, the so on Soviet respect for immigration rights? And there's been very little research that's been done outside of the political realm to look at how this movement shaped American Jewish culture. And I'm a sociologist who looks at the intersection of politics and religion and culture, and that's the approach that I'm taking. I'm looking at this as, as a cultural movement. This is also, um, I also do work in American studies and in sociology, and from the perspective of American studies, there's, there's a notion of uh, Cold War culture, you know, for those who remember this. You know, living through the Cold War, there was a culture to that moment, and this is looking at how one American ethnic group, religious group, had a very, very distinctive Cold War experience. And you'll see in a bit some of the ways in which the American experience of the Cold War through this movement was, was, was different. And then finally, the context of the sociology of social movements, this really is looking at the tactics that the movement adopted and how the tactics spun off un unintended consequences of shaping an American Jewish culture that was not the goal but it was the, that was one of the things that happened. And once they stopped mobilizing, that whole culture disappeared. So if we go to the next slide, please. Yeah. All right. Yeah, great. Right. Okay, thank you. To see 250,000 people turn out on behalf of a cause would lead you to think, well, you know, this is something that naturally resonated with people and you tell them, you know, American Jews, your, your brothers and sisters in the Soviet Union are being oppressed and they'll, they'll naturally get out and stand up for them. Quick, next slide, please. This one. Nice. That was not the way that the activists in the early 1960s experienced the response from American Jewry when they first tried to raise the issue. And the first challenge that the movement had was to wake up American Jews and to make them aware of a situation and to make them feel that they had some obligation to get out there and do something about it. So we can go to the next. Thanks. Elie Wiesel, in this book, The Jews of Silence, he publishes this in 1966. So a few years after the first organizations were created. He actually, the, Isra the Israelis had a clandestine organization that was trying to stir up uh, activism in the West around Soviet Jewry, and they sent Eli Wiesel to Russia to go meet with Soviet Jews and to write about it. And they said, you've been a witness for the dead, now you must be a witness for the living. Uh, that's how Eli Wiesel tells the story. It's, a, it's very much in his own voice. I'd, very, I'd be very surprised if the Israelis who sent them actually use those types of terms. It's too poetic. Um, the Jews of Silence, just out of curiosity, has anyone read the book? Okay, one, two. All right. Um, this was, you know, for a time it was required reading of people who were connected with this movement. And the idea was that the Jews in the Soviet Union, were, their voices were being suppressed and could not be heard. They were, they were cowed into silence. And that's the manifest meaning of the title. And a lot of what he's talking about is the fear um, in the, there are informers in the synagogues, and you walk into a synagogue, it's supposed to be a site of Jewish worship, Jewish pride, Jewish prayer, and people are, know before whom you stand, which is written over the, the, the um, altar, the pulpit, at synagogues, Ali Wiesel says, know, know, behind, know who is standing behind you. But he ends this book by saying, what torments me most is not the Jews of silence I met in Russia, but the silence of the Jews I live among today. And it was that problem of an American Jewish community that was unaware, apathetic, and not actually standing up to, to deal with this issue that the activists first faced. So let's go to the next slide. In New York, 
One of the first three of the movement organizations that are found, this one is the Student Struggle for Soviet Jewry. It's founded by a British immigrant uh, named Jacob Birnbaum. He's in, he's in his mid-30s. He decides, I'm not, this is 1964, I'm not going to mobilize adults, I'm going to mobilize the youth. It's the 60s, you want to get anything done, don't look to the adults to do it. You want to get people to the streets, you got to get the kids. That was basically his reasoning. Um, and he, this is a handbook from summer 1965 from his, from his organization. And he uses the shofar, the ram's horn, blown at, uh, at Rosh Hashanah. Um, as a symbol for the movement in its early times. And when he would reflect later on this, he would talk about this period in the, in his, in, in the student struggle as the shofar period of the movement. So the shofar, the ram's horn, it can mean many things. Here you're looking at a march in which the, these are, I think there's seven rabbis, <coughs> all with the shofars, with the rams, when they're marching around the Soviet embassy, the Soviet consulate or UN mission in New York, they're going to encircle it seven times. And every time they're going to sound the shofar, and they're going to bring the walls of tyranny down, just like the, just like the walls of Jericho came down with the sound of the shofar. So this is, the shofar is a battle cry. It's a symbol of redemption in Jewish religious tradition. But it's also a call to action, and it is a wake-up call for American Jews. And Birnbaum is explicitly using the symbol to communicate to American Jews, wake up, wake up to this issue. Um, let's go to the next slide. In Cleveland, the activists there took a very different tack. So Herb Karen and Lou Rosenblum are the founders of an organization which they first called the Cleveland Committee on Soviet Antisemitism, and then they later renamed it the Cleveland Council on Soviet Antisemitism. And the first thing that they tried to do was to mobilize leaders. They, Karen, in October 63, is writing letters to, to political leaders, to leaders of the labor movement, to, um, to religious leaders, clergy of all faiths, trying to get statements from them about the importance of, of Soviet Jewry as an issue, and he wants to use this to mobilize Jewish organizations to spur them to action. The American Jewish organizations are beginning to organize themselves um, at the, around the same time, and Karen and Rosenblum go in April of 1964 to a convening of an American Jewish conference on Soviet Jewry. And this is a conference that is supposed to lay the groundwork for a national organization that would bring together the, the Jewish Federation system, the philanthropic system, uh, the communal defense agencies like the Anti-Defamation League and the, and the American Jewish Committee and American Jewish Congress, the umbrella groups for all the big synagogue religious denominations, the Reform Movement, the Orthodox Movement, the Conservative Movement, and a host of other organizations, Hadassah, the Zionist Organization of America and uh, Jewish Labor Committee, uh, and it ran the gap. And they go and they bring a pamphlet with them, Soviet terror against Jews, how Cleveland initiated an interfaith protest, and they wanted to tell these national organizations, we know how to do this because we have already done it locally. And they set up a local committee with the mayor and leading clergy and leading notables in Cleveland who were on the letterhead and were the nominal uh, uh, chairs of a Cleveland committee on Soviet anti-Semitism. And they're going, to this they're going to this organizational meeting and they want to see action. They're worried that it's just gonna be a one-time conference and then the organization will say, there, we've done our part and we're done. And so they bring a resolution from the floor. They get denounced from the podium as, uh, as Bundists you know, Jewish uh, la la labor rights, la la so uh, socialist uh, labor rights, um, but they do manage to push the main organizations to do more than they were originally planning to do. The conflict between the, the local grassroots groups, such as the Cleveland Committee and the Student Struggle and the, and the larger national establishment groups is something that will persist throughout the movement uh, itself and will come up in a, 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 a bit uh, again. Uh, in some of the slides ahead. Okay, so let's go to the next, uh, actually, one, one more thing about this. 
by, this is 1964, by 1968, Karen has dropped out, Rosenblum is now leading this organization, and he has given up on seeing the national Jewish organizations take the leadership that he wants them to see, and so what he does is he begins to see local Soviet Jewry councils in com Jewish communities across the country. And he organizes them through an umbrella union of councils of Soviet Jews, where the, it start, it, it's headquartered in Cleveland first, but then it's headquartered in Chicago, and it rotates um, from time to time. But the idea was you don't need to be in New York, you don't need to be in Washington to be effective as a political activist. You can create local activism, and you can network the activists so that you find out what's going on in Miami, you bring it up to the national, and the national will disseminate it to all the other communities so that Chicago can do it, and Denver can do it, and San Francisco can do it, and Cleveland can do it, and the like. And this was the structure that, that the Union of Councils used. It's also the structure, by the way, that the establishment organizations, the National Conference on Soviet Jewry, uh, ended up using as well through the federation system, through the local community relations councils. So this was a model that basically said, Geography, not as important as you might think as long as you're networked at a national level. Let's go to the next slide. So what were they trying to do? And here is the initial model that the activists had for how they thought they were going to get the Soviets to change their policy. They did not believe that a small group of activists alone would be able to get Brezhnev to change what he was doing, okay, to change policy. Um, if the Politburo was going to make his decisions, who knew how the Politburo made his decisions, but they didn't think that they alone were going to be able to exert the leverage that they would need to, to exert. So what they wanted to do was to mobilize American Jewry. And they wanted an American Jewish grassroots movement to pressure American Jewish institutions. Because American Jewish institutions, they felt, had the clout. The clout to pressure the US government to pressure the Soviets. Ultimately, it was this. This was the target, to get to the US government and to enlist its support because they figured they have leverage over the Kremlin, if anyone. And that was the idea. It ends up actually getting more complicated as the movement um, unfolds. And if we just click on the, on the animation. By the late 1960s, Soviet Jews themselves started speaking up. And before then, the American Jewish activists were, were trying to organize, but they didn't know any Soviet Jews. They couldn't name any of them. By the late 1960s, Soviet Jews are writing letters, and they're sending them to the United Nations. They're trying to get them out, and they're signing their names to this. Some are suffering consequences for it, but there is the movement of Soviet Jews themselves begins to develop as well. And the activists in the states and the activists in the Soviet Union make contact with each other. And when there are delegations of senators and, uh, and uh, congressional representatives that are going to Russia, guess who they're meeting with? And then there's a direct connection between Soviet Jewish activists and the US Congress. The US Embassy was very helpful um, to Americans who were going into the Soviet Union to help this movement. Uh, so the ties got more complicated. And American Jews were essentially were in some instances going around their institutions to you know to just work directly with their representatives. And we could go off on a long tangent if you want in the QA. This is Capitol Hill, but you have Capitol Hill and you have the White House and they did not see eye to eye on a number of issues related to this cause. And so American Jews were, in a lot of ways, working with Capitol Hill against the White House in the Nixon years. Later in the Reagan years, they were working with the, uh, with the White House much more, much more directly. All right, next slide, please. Thank you. So the key challenges the movement faced. First, how to make an invisible problem visible. Why is it invisible? 
because it's the 1960s and it's behind the Iron Curtain. And people were not being killed. There were no images. Like, what's the iconic image from this movement? It's hard to think of one. Maybe when the refusenik Anatoly Natan Sharovsky was released, finally after years in prison, and he's crossing over the bridge uh, in, uh, you know, from East Germany to West Germany, and he goes back and forth as a last, uh, um, yeah, to the, to the Soviets, who told him to walk straight. Um, and there's a picture of that, maybe that. There's no, there are no visuals that are connected with this movement. It's happening far away. It's happening behind the Iron Curtain in the midst of the Cold War. It's invisible. And, and it's a plight. It's slow oppression. It's the closing of a synagogue here and then a closing of a synagogue there and the shuttering of a Jewish theater group. And, and it's quiet surveillance and it's harassment. You can't see this. How do you make it visible? Second, how do you take a distant problem and make it close? Okay, even if you can make this visible, it's pretty really far away. How do you make the distant problem close and how do you make people feel like they have a personal stake in this? Then, well, who's their target? Their target's a superpower. Their target's a superpower in the midst of the Cold War. How are American citizens, the citizens, going to go up against the Soviet Union and force policy change? And then finally, no one knows how long this, people, are, people are going to need to mobilize to actually achieve what they want to achieve. No one knows if they're going to be successful. In retrospect, we know that they were, and we know that by the early 1970s, they were seeing their first policy successes with the Soviets changing their immigration, liberalizing their immigration policies. They didn't know this at the time, and no one had any idea that the Soviet Union was going to collapse. They thought they were going to, this could be 100 years. How do you sustain a movement in perpetuity? So some of the key solutions that they that they came to. And they didn't know this when they started their work. They learned as they went along through trial and error. And when they went down some paths, they discovered, hey, we were, we, were, we were sending tourists into the Soviet Union to make contact with Soviet Jews to get information out to make this invisible problem visible. But we're discovering that people are coming back inspired to become incredibly active in the movement and it's going to sustain commitment. That wasn't the original goal, but they're discovering that the tactics that they adopt have other unintended consequences that were also in some ways helpful for the movement. So I'll give you a basic overview of what the solutions are, and then we're going to look in, 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 at some examples. Okay. So first, to make it close, they made it personal. They attached names and faces, so it wasn't just the Soviet Jewry, a collective singular, an abstraction, actual real people and they made it close and personal by engaging people in ways that were connected to their identities. You're a doctor, join medical mobilization for Soviet Jewry. You're a lawyer, join legal advocacy for Soviet Jewry. You're a Hebrew school teacher, help design curricula around Soviet Jewry. So they engaged people around professional identities, they engaged them in, in ways that were, um, that were personal and close to them as well. Make it local and make it national. I mentioned this before. This was the model that the Cleveland Council used. See the local communities and use an umbrella structure so that the information can go. There's an innovation here. You get it up to the, to the national and then it can go out everywhere. And I should say make it international because they had colleagues in you know, throughout Western Europe, South America, uh, Australia this was, uh, and Israel, of course, and this was uh, this was not just an American movement. Make it timely and make it timeless. So we'll see the timeliness in the ways that this tapped Cold War culture, and we'll see when people were going into the Soviet Union um, how that really gave them a Cold War experience that uh, was well, of the type that others were only getting in the movies. Um, and make it timeless. They connected this to core Jewish narrative. You already saw this. Let my people go. The basic Jewish story. And we'll look in, in some detail in a second. And then the last two things, and 
these I think are the most important. Make it a cultural movement. They took what could be a political cause. This is about immigration rights. And they turned it into a way for American Jews to be Jewish, to do Jewish. They made it about American Jewish culture. It was not, that was not the main goal, but by doing that, they got it into every Jewish institution. Maybe not the delis, maybe not the cemeteries, but you know, for most of the, the camps, the schools, the JCCs, the federations, the synagogues, they did. And then they learned how to see like activists and to look with activist lenses. Everything is an opportunity for mobilization and nothing is off limits. Not the most sacred holidays. They too are objects that can be mobilized in the service of the cause. So let's take a look at some ways in which we did this and go the next time. So when the movement began, Soviet Jewry was an abstraction. The USSR was a mystery to America. Soviet Jewry, it's, this is the collective singular. There are no names attached to it. Elie Wiesel goes there and all he comes back saying is these are Jews of silence. And he'll tell stories about them, but there are no names, there are no real people. It's a cause, but it's an abstraction. How do they make it personal? So it's only in late 60s, early 70s that they begin attaching the names and faces. Once the Soviets, the, once Soviet Jews themselves started writing letters with their ad names and addresses saying, let us out, and sending these, trying to get these out to the, to the West, the movement organizations were able to take the names and addresses and then get some information about these people. They worked through tourists and the like, and I'll see that in a second. Um, Cleveland was one of the communities that really took the lead in creating a people-to-people -people approach to, uh, to organizing for Soviet Jewry. So this is a brochure that was published by the Cleveland Committee on Soviet Antisemitism in 1971. Soviet prisoners of conscience. And if you look at the cover, what do you see? You see a bunch of faces. There are no names on the cover. There are names inside. Um, but you also see one anonymous silhouette. And this gets at, in some ways, the dilemma that the movement faced in terms of making things personal. Here, each one of these people is an individual, and there's a story behind each person and why they're a prisoner. And so and these stories are told on the inside, but when you put them all together, ordered like that, like it's a high school yearbook, it suggests that they're interchangeable, so much so that you can have your, your silhouette that's representing the people who are yet to be added to this list and the like. So there's information. They're personalizing, but at the same time, this challenge of how you deal with an abstraction is still something that is very present. And what Rosenblum, Lou Rosenblum at the Cleveland Council did was he tried to move beyond the, this half personalization, but actually creating person-to-person -person relationships. And so the Union of Councils, the, this is the umbrella organization that included Cleveland and the other communities, um, created adopted family programs where people would, uh, they would get the list and they would choose a family and they would write letters. Hopefully they would get letters back and hopefully the letters would be received. Um, they had done this, that actually spun off from an adopt a prisoner program, which was the first thing and that came out of this book. There was letter writing, there was eventually tourism, and the combination of the adoptive family and the, and the tourism led to the twinning of bar and bat mitzvah ceremonies, which I'll tell you about uh, in uh, a few steps ahead. But just so you get a sense that the movement starts moving down a path and it spins off other things that could not have existed until they had done some of these earlier steps. Step one, we know who the prisoners are. Let's adopt the prisoners, let's write letters to them, let's find out what they need and try to send in things to uh, send in the, the food, vitamin pills, uh, and the like, okay? Girly cards to bribe the, uh, the, the guards, the prisoners as well, they did that too. How do you make the Soviet Union close? 
when it's how many thousands of miles away, you go. You can actually, you can actually go there. Well, not anymore, but then you could. You could actually go to the Soviet Union. And you go on a tourist visa. And it was the era of detente. And detente was celebrating. You know, that tourism is going to build connections between the peoples. And <coughs> there are, Fodor's publishes its first guide to the Soviet Union in 1974. Just to give you a sense of what the climate was like, there is an increase in tourism, and the movement seizes on this. It uses tourism to bring Americans, both activists and average American Jews who, they may be going on vacation, right? But you know what? You're going on vacation. I'm the head of the Soviet Jury Committee in our synagogue, um, and I know that you're going on a vacation. Would you mind taking some time during your vacation to meet with some refuseniks? And we'll give you a list of addresses, uh, a list of things to bring to them. Blue jeans to sell on the black market, um, medicines. This person is suffering from, you know, from hypertension, so bring whatever the, the, the hypertension medication was at the time. Um, they use tourism to provide moral support for Soviet Jews and to bring information, moral and material support, and to bring information out. Information about new refusers, people who apply to emigrate and are refused permission and then persecuted because they could dare to ask. Um, information about the legal status of, of these refuseniks, information about their, what's happening with their employment. You apply to emigrate, you lose your job. So how are you supporting yourself? Um, information on their health status. And this information, when it came back into the organization's hands, got distilled into databases that were, that, where they kept the records on as many of the refuseniks as they were able to keep records on with the with the hope of using that information to then support them further through more letter writing, sending more travelers, through lobbying, so that you have uh, you have the, the American government pressing the case of the Soviets. This person is an especially dire need. Please let the person out. And the and the and tourists were used essentially as, as couriers for information. Um, the Israelis actually began this before the American Jewish groups discovered it. They started using it in the, they, they actually were planning to use it in 1967, but the Six Day War, June 67, uh, leads to the severing of diplomatic relations between the Soviet Union and Israel. And so this idea of using Israeli tourists falls by the wayside. The Israelis turned to using diaspora Jewish tourists um, to go in. And one of the reasons that the American groups got on board with creating their own tourism program was they, they wanted to break the Israeli monopoly on control over information about the refusants because they felt that their autonomy as movement organizations was being constrained and they wanted to be able to set their own policies uh, to, to, to do their activism as they saw fit. And so the Union of Councils, for example, set up their tourism program so that they could create their own database rather than be reliant on the database of refusants that the Israeli government was giving to the, the establishment organization, the National, uh, the National Conference. And the National Conference gets on board to do this because it's being outflanked by a grassroots group. So it's sort of, this is a lot of inside baseball, but lest you think that the movement is proceeding rationally because it has identified what its goals are and it's going to go in a straight line to get there, that's not the way that these things unfold. In the debates over how uh, the debates over Cold War culture and how Americans experience Cold War culture, the historian Peter Filene he he dissents. He, there's a book, Rethinking Cold War Culture. It's an edited volume, and there's one naysayer in, in the volume. The naysayer Peter Filene says, "Look, the Cold War was primarily fought at an elite level and pervaded and shaped the experience of ordinary Americans far less than historians would have us believe." And that may be true overall, I would say not so in this case, and that for American Jews who were engaged in this movement, things were different. Okay, what you're looking at here are two guidebooks that were published to help American Jews. Oh, sorry. I have my timer on. It must have heard me say, okay, people, I shouldn't say okay, <laughs> stop. Um, you have guidebooks that the movement organizations created to help American Jews make contact with Soviet Jews. Because in tourists, the Soviet Tourism Agency, 
was not helping the American tourists to do this. People were going on package tours and were sneaking away. They were being followed. They were being surveilled. They, some were arrested and some were kicked out of the country after being interrogated. I, I have, there are about uh, 2,000 of these reports from travelers who went, and they're all online. If you go to the American Jewish Historical Society archives, you can read them. And I've put together a database of all these, and it seems that about 5% of these reports are describing situations where people were interrogated and kicked out of the country, but the majority of them were describing situations of at least being surveilled, or when going through customs, um, having some type of a harsh interrogation where people, where, where the, customs, the customs agents knew what was going on, and there is a cat and mouse back and forth between the tourists who were bringing in the forbidden Jewish books, um, and the customs agents who were sometimes confiscating, sometimes not. Um, behind this, the Russian trip, March, March 1984, Barry Kabachnikov, Rabbi Barry Kabachnikov. Uh, he's a Miami, he was a Miami rabbi. This is one of the thousands of reports that is posted online, that was written by someone who was sent by the movement organizations, and then wrote back. One of the really interesting things, this is where it taps Cold War culture, is that he's giving information that is useless to the organizations, but it makes very clear that this trip was really meaningful to him in a really particular way. And I'll read you an excerpt from it. Departure on Monday, March 19, 1984, preface. At the airport, I immediately encountered a mild discomfort and wearing a heavy overcoat and carrying a rather heavy schlep bag and sundry other items, camera, etc., in my free hand. As expected, my departure gate was at the furthest possible point from the airport terminal. I arrived totally out of breath and was confronted with my first challenge. Remember, once you reach the airport, you are an ordinary tourist, you are no longer a rabbi. These words echoed in my mind as I stood toe to toe with a congregant's parents. Going to New York, Rabbi? They asked in an oh, sorry. They asked, going to New York, Rabbi? They asked in an offhand manner. I looked both ways before admitting with a casual shrug, perhaps. Checkpoint Charlie. I call in and I'm informed that my traveling companion has been placed on a flight that has mechanical failure. He is not going to arrive in time. And then a little bit later, it's apparent to me that HS, that's the companion, has been found out, it's in scare quotes, has been found out by the opposition. They know he is coming, and they will not allow him to arrive. They won't even let him depart. This is tongue in cheek. His thing is filled with humor, but check my chart. My second call indicates that HS is a resourceful ally. ally. We reconnoiter and exchange goods as prearranged. In flight, I read Ken Follett, the man from St. Petersburg, to get in the mood. Appropriately, the flight shows a James Bond flick. <laughs> Checkpoint Charlie, reconnoiter, perhaps. And this is written in with a hyperbole and with a, with a panache that you don't see in most of the reports. But the experience of going into the Soviet Union, of crossing, of being very, very nervous, of crossing through customs, of discovering that you actually do have a tail, a KGB tail. Um, going into apartments to meet Soviet Jews and writing on magic slate. This is the, I don't know if they use them anymore. Uh, you write, it's, it's, it's gray, it's plastic. You write on it and you lift it up and it disappears because you can't talk. Yeah. They were, they, this was a Cold War experience. They were playing out, and when they, they a, a number of these reports, when they'll describe it, they'll describe it as a bad spy movie. They won't just call it a spy movie, they'll say it's a bad spy movie. And one of the things I'm trying to figure out is why they, why they refer to it as a bad spy movie. I think the reason is that they actually don't have any characterization. But the KGB are stock characters, the stock bad guys, and they're, they're plot devices, that, but they're experiencing it. And so it's in some ways, you know, this is, this is tourism. Tourism is, is, is there's something about ex, ex, uh, simulation and experience, and they're having a really good Cold War. Dodge the KGB. It's actually dangerous. We don't know how much, but it's safe enough that we're willing to go. 
type of experience. Most Americans were reading Ken Follett or watching James Bond, but they were not going and doing this themselves. The doctors were going on medical missions. The lawyers were going on legal missions. The rabbis, Jewish educators, Jewish studies professors were going and were teaching Judaica. Scientists and engineers were going and lecturing to out of work um, scientists and engineers, refuseniks, about their fields of expertise. So it's up close, it's personal, and it can be even more personal because it can engage your professional identity uh, as well if, you're, if you have something to bring. Um, there's so much going on with Twitter, we can talk about that in the Q&A. Uh, all right, let's go on to the Bar Mitzvah Twin. Let me see if I can get my timer back up. Okay. And I'll try to wrap this up uh, in a short minutes for Q&A. Um, out of the tourism and out of the adoptive family comes the idea of twinning bar and bot mitzvahs. This is also a person-to-person -person, uh, connection. It begins with an activist from Washington who has adopted a family and goes and actually meets the family and they have kids the same age and the kids are approaching bar and bat mitzvah age 12, 13. Um, and they decide, you know what, we should pair the kids up. And this then evolves into something that if you attended a bar and bat mitzvah in the 1980s, early 1980s, you probably sat through a twin ceremony where the, where, so here you know, our American bar and mitzvah boy will read the Torah portion on behalf of, these are actually this is a twinning of t twins, believe it or not, um, of the Soviets in absentia who could not, who could not be there. To give you a sense first of how the think about the chutzpah of this, by the way. Okay, this is your kid's bar bat mitzvah, and you have activists telling you, you know, here it's mobilized, right? You have a captive audience, all these people, right? Jews, not just all the guests are sitting there, and they're going to listen to what the bar bat mitzvah kid says, right? But the parents, this is what you should be doing. The activists, for, it wasn't chutzpah, if you're, this is what it means to be a good Jew, is to do this. Um, and it was the same rationale that led them to mobilize Jewish holidays, every, every Jewish holiday. Um, but it's that idea of seeing every moment as an opportunity for mobilization. And this one combines the people to people with the religious importance, with the deeply personal this is your coming of age. It's also something in the context of Cold War culture that marries Jewish identity and a Cold War American identity. And I'll read you. This is a, a letter that one uh, bat mitzvah, Faith Lowy, 1983, Poughkeepsie, New York, Vassar Temple. She wrote to Action for Soviet Jewry, which is a Boston-based uh, group, thanking them and reporting back as to what happened. Um, so here's her, I'll read a part of her bat mitzvah speech. Um, I haven't read a, read a bar mitzvah speech since my own in 1982. But. When Moses and the Israelites were camping in the desert, the people grew tired of manna and complained to Moses. They desired the meat and vegetables they had eaten as slaves in Egypt. They had forgotten that their freedom was more important than the fancy food. Sometimes, like the Israelites, we do not value our freedom in America. We complain about unimportant things and forget the reason we are still living here. Jews, as well as many other persecuted groups, came to America because it offered them the independence that is essential for a rewarding life. In nations like the Soviet Union, many people do not have freedom of religion nor freedom to leave the country. I hope that one day, Yana, this is her bat mitzvah twin, uh, Yana Grauer uh, from Chernovitz or Chernovsky, Chernovsky in the Ukraine, I hope that one day, Yana will be able to come to America, so she will have the opportunity to study Judaism, which then guarantees her the freedom to be a Jew. Now that I know someone without it, I have realized that freedom is an important part of my life. Amen. <laughs> Other work in Cold War culture talks about Cold War as something that is inspiring fear. And here, this is a form of Cold War culture that is making this 13-year-old girl feel very empowered. She's getting up there, she's speaking, she's, she's speaking to her crowd, and she's telling people what she thinks. And it, it, it reads, this is it's freedom, 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 and it's, it's, it's flag-waving. This is an American Cold War speech as much as it is a Jewish 
but it's for speech. And you think about what the freedom is that Yana will have by coming to America. It's the freedom, it's religious freedom, and it's the freedom to be Jewish religiously. That's really the, that's the extent of it, the way that she frames it. Um, but this is a this is a moment that brings together religion, the personalization, um, whole war culture in a in a way that I think here that fighting may be right overall. I think he's wrong about this. American Jewish kids who had bar and bat mitzvahs from the 19, late 1970s through the late 1980s, most of them were doing this type of a thing. And Yana Grau, by the way, was twinned with um, three hundred, sorry, with, oh sorry, Yana Grau was twinned with 34 other bat mitzvah girls in 1982. So not just Faith Lowy. And during the same period that Faith was having her bat mitzvah, Action for Soviet Jewry twin 65 refusing children <coughs> with 319 American bar and bat mitzvahs in 46 communities across Massachusetts and in 16 other states. And that was just one organization that was doing this. If anyone was connected with ORT, ORT was, the, was the, one of the organizations that, that took uh, on this, uh, this issue. All right. Um, I'm going to, let me wrap it up so we have time for Q&A. Um, we can talk about holiday mobilizations. There's just one other thing I want to show you. If you go forward, uh, go forward one more. Simchat, go back, Simchat Torah programs. Every holiday was mobilized, including the holiday that you've never heard of, the fast of the 10th of Tibet. This is no Jews heard of this holiday, right, except, uh, but um, they, every holiday they could mobilize, they mobilized. Simchat Torah, 1969, local communities across the country are doing things. The national organization here, it's the National Conference on Soviet Jewry, or the American Jewish Conference at the time. Um, is taking that information and disseminating it back out. Youngstown, Ohio, JCC, October 12th, 1969, Simchat Torah program. This was everywhere. It was here. It was local. It was national. Um, let's go to the last, go to the slide with the, just move forward. And, yeah, the, yeah. This one? Yeah, so what did, what did the, they made it timely. They tied it in. Sorry, made it timeless. They tied it in to the into life cycle ritual. They tied it into the holidays, into core Exodus narrative. They made it timely. This was Cold War culture. You want to be on the cutting edge of history in the middle of the Cold War? Go into the Soviet Union and dodge the KGB, and you'll feel like you're living in your historical moment. They made it local. They made it national. They. They made it close, and they found ways to bring the Soviets here. You know, if there's a Soviet cultural group, they protested there. But if the Soviets weren't coming here, they brought American Jews there. And they also had the connections here. Letter writing, phone calls, and the like, and they made it personal. Ultimately, what they did is they, they did not shut off their lenses in terms of look how they look at things. They looked at everything as activists. Everything could be mobilized. And that got this movement all over the place, and because of that, it shaped Jewish culture. In some ways, the Soviet Jews were, were I don't want to say irrelevant, they were, um, but this was a cultural movement that was important for American Jews to be engaged and shape the ways that they were doing Jewish. Go to the next slide. And that's the way that they saved American Jewry in the, in the process. Uh, Viktor Frankl, psychotherapist, Holocaust survivor, he wrote in Man's Search for Meaning, don't aim at success. The more you aim at it and make it a target, the more you are going to miss it. For success, like happiness, cannot be pursued. It must ensue. And it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself. When this movement ended, American Jewry discovered that it had what they called at the time a continuity crisis. Oh no, American Jews are assimilating and are going to disappear. They had a galvanizing cause, and in that moment when they had a galvanizing cause, Jews were turning out in the street and they were turning out proud. And identity followed from the activism. When the activism stopped, to tell people, oh, you should feel Jewish and do why? They were, you can't pursue identity. Identity, like success, like happiness, it ensues, and the movement understood that. And that is how, in that you know, three-decade period, it managed to save American Jewry, even though it was essentially trying to save Soviet Jewry. So I'll put it to questions. Thank you. It's 
normally, when, when there's a talk like this, normally the person hosting says, well, it's my prerogative as the chair to ask the first question, and usually that means that there are no questions from the audience and they're buying some time. And tonight I didn't need to do that uh, because Dr. Kamen's talk was so fascinating. It touched a lot of us, I think, personally, and those of us who weren't personally or familiarly involved in Delight of Truly. So I want to rephrase my question as a comment. Uh, a lot of Dr. Kellner's work, pieces that I teach in the classroom, has to do with the transformation of Jewish rituals at home, of taking sacred home space and politicizing even that. Um, after university, I went to Prague, where I was working in a small Jewish community. This was 2000. It wasn't the Cold War. It was demo capitalist democracy. What we still saw people of the Soviet Jewry movement age coming to Prague and sort of still expecting to see the, the, the Soviet law, would ask my friends, tell me your story. And they'd look confused because what do you mean, my Czech friends? And I knew what that language was because my mother would used to give speeches that said, I want to tell you a story about a woman named Razel, and Razel, this is I believe the name my mother spoke about, and Reza lives like this, or like that. And that would mobilize people in the way that Dr. Kellner spoke. I was always concerned. I would ask them, well, what's your story? And they wouldn't have a story. They said, well, I'm just a fill in your profession here. And I want to thank Dr. Kellner, because one of the things that his lecture is doing, and that his book will do, and I have no doubt that it will be fascinating, is that it's telling American Jewry its own story, so that when American Jews talk about themselves. It's no longer only referencing the people in the Soviet Union, the people whom they're seeking to help, but referencing their own development. And from that, we can learn lessons even about the activism today. So I want to once again thank Dr. Kellner, and thank you to the Steel Museum for hosting us, and wonderful hosts. And thank you all for coming, and for your questions, there's still refreshments in the back. Have a nice evening.